Well, ladies and gentlemen, time now. Our right after this session is to get an entrepreneur insight. Pivoting your business model and syncing it with the largest market opportunity. We have with us Mr. Kunal Behel, founder and CEO, Snapdeal. Kunal managing the strategic vision, key business relationships, fundraising and growth plans for Snapdeal. An engineer from University of Pennsylvania with a business degree from the Wharton School and an executive marketing program at the Kellogg School of Management. Kunal's prior experience included product managing and business development with Microsoft's Emerging Market Group and at Deloitte Consulting as a consultant in the company's telecom practice in New York and Pennsylvania. Let's hear it for Mr. Kunal Behel, please. Well, thank you for having me. It seems like a nice, intimate audience. How many are entrepreneurs here? Okay. And uh, how many are investors? The gross mismatch. Um, and, and is everyone, how many are technology entrepreneurs? And non-tech? That's great. That's excellent. And um, uh, how many are operating businesses versus soon to be started? Operating. operating. Okay, great. So hopefully what I'm gonna talk about uh, is helpful. Uh, I think it'll be helpful to both audiences. A little bit of background about myself. Actually, they already shared the background, but uh, me and my uh, high school friend, Rohit, we started the company together and um, We've had a very, very interesting journey. I think a lot of people just see us as, okay, the Snapdeal guys or whatever. Uh, but our journey has actually been very interesting, very engaging, also very enriching, and, and very stressful alongside. Um, uh, and along the way, we've actually had to change our model very, very frequently, relative, uh, relatively speaking. And today, I'll just walk you through the various changes we've had to make and why and what, were our, what was our thought process in making those changes. Maybe some of those are helpful, maybe some of those are not. But we'll do Q&A after that and maybe address specific questions that any of you may be encountered with. Um, and, but I always start any talk with the caveat that uh, we are not really, I don't consider most startups in India as having reached the pinnacle of success, neither have we. So whatever I share today, um, put your own flavor on that because if you just follow it to the T, it may screw up your business. So I just want to put that caveat out there. So we, um, actually when, uh, uh, when the VC Circle folks called and said, you know, can you come and give a talk about pivots, I actually started thinking how many pivots we actually did. We probably did more than seven, but I could think about seven big ones. And this is over a period of maybe three years. Right, uh, I think most businesses who are successful have had it have had to do similar number or higher number of pivots. If you take Amazon, you take Netflix, um, you know there's so many businesses out there who are surviving and thriving, and have had to do various pivots along the way. So our starting point, actually, this was end of 2007, early 2008, was we wanted to start start a movie booking site. It was, we registered the domain moviebooking.com. This was, this were the days, this is pre-book my show days actually. And we thought that, you know, of course people love watching movies, so we should do this. And soon we realized we had absolutely no experience in any internet business and this business would require a lot of internet expertise. Also when we started talking to the, um, to the various uh, cinema chains, they started telling us, hey, at the end of the day, you're going to make maybe five rupees on a ticket. So somehow it didn't make sense to us that we do put in all the effort, learn how to build an internet business, and then we'll be making five rupees a ticket. So we said, that doesn't make sense. Not like we had other great ideas. So I would say the first pivot was, um, okay, let's do something that can make a little bit of money and something no one else has done before. So in 2007, 2008, retail was taking off very rapidly in India and there was a lot of investment. In retrospect, everyone knows it was a bubble. Um, but back then there was a lot of excitement in the, in, the, in the retail space in India. So what we did was we started with these coupon books. And, uh, and these coupon books were basically very simple. There were a lot of retailers that were part of it and you had terrible coupons that you could take to the retailer and redeem. And 
we thought we spent about seven, eight months on getting this launched because you think about the problems you have. You have two guys in a PowerPoint, you walk up to a restaurant and you say, give me a deal. And the restaurant guy will say, but why? Um, and, and so the same problem we had with everyone we spoke. But eventually, I think we just used brutal force. I don't think there was a lot of intelligence that we put, which is brutality of approach. And we signed up, I think, 150 brands and restaurants, etc. And we launched this product. But what happened was, within three months of launching, we realized that uh, in India, retail distribution is a big problem. So if you have a product like this, there is almost, almost no place that you can distribute it and make money. So we suddenly started realizing that if we don't sell it in good time, we are going to be stuck with a lot of perishable inventory of booklets which won't be worth the money they're printed on. So then we said, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's reduce the friction of carrying a booklet which expires uh, in the user experience, from the user experience. So at back around, this is around end of 2008, early 2009, Suddenly, people were start, started talking about mobile and mobile internet and mobile as a means of, beyond a means of communication, taking off. So he said, why don't we migrate our entire offline business of coupon books onto the mobile? To this day, I actually think it was a very smart idea what we did. I think it was just ahead of its time. So we started doing, we started distributing or selling scratch cards where you scratch, you register your mobile and you start getting coupons on your mobile when you're near an outlet by you know pulling it say press Adidas and you get some coupon and this is what we did for a few months and it actually took a very good trajectory uh, I think we got up to about 170,000 users in a span of about 35 40 days the issue was they were all uh, not paying they were all free freemium customers and the moment we asked them to pay I think our usage went down to 1,000 uh, overnight. So we realized that you know in in India, jo dikta hai, wo dikta hai, right? So people couldn't touch, people couldn't feel, they didn't want to pay. So we said, okay. So now what's next? Um, we have to figure out a way to make money on this business. Clearly, people like it; otherwise, they won't even use it in the first place. So what do we do? So we tried to blend the best of both worlds. People like the physical product, the booklet. But they didn't want, uh, and, but they, you know, it was perishable. People liked the usage convenience of not having to carry a book, but they didn't want to pay for it. So, what's the middle path? So, we came up with a card, which was again, you know, if you think about it, the back end is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. The merchants are the same, the contracts are the same, the deals are the same. So, we started selling cards, which were valid for about 12 months. And we said, why don't you, that we started selling these to corporates who started using it as a customer, channel partner, or uh, employee benefit program. And this started doing pretty well, actually, because we realized that the perceived value of a product like this was very high relative to the price that the, that the company had to pay. So we said we had made it, right? And we were running this for, I would say, about six to nine months. And we were the most successful entrepreneurs since Bill Gates. Um, and, and, and around that time, what happened was that we started getting some calls in the early part of 2010, maybe about 27, 28 months ago, a little over two years ago. We started getting some calls from some uh, merchants we had worked with over the previous year and a half who were basically saying, hey, um, we have started doing some, we started delivering, uh, you know, distributing our coupons through some online sites, which are essentially Groupon clones. Um, we know you, we trust you, why don't you guys do this also, right? Because it just seemed logical. I think that's where the value of building strong relationships, even if the business wasn't very large, really came through. So we had, um, we, we suddenly had, uh, we encountered a key decision point that should we change our, should we change our business again? Um, so this would be the fourth change. Uh, in 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 maybe a year and a half or two years, less than two years, so this was January 25th when we got these calls, couple of calls. January 26th, uh, Rohit and I. January 26th, the Republic Day, so offices has have to be shut uh, by law. So we sat in a coffee shop near our office and we said, okay, let's just think through this. Uh, can we really do this? Do we really want to do this? Uh, and how do we do this? 
So we sat for about seven, eight hours in the coffee shop, and I think we drank like crazy amount of coffee that day. And at the end of it, we we came up with a name, which ended up being Snap Tea. Uh, that you know, let's just migrate our business online and let's test it out without shutting down what was working, which was the card business. And eight days later. We launched Snap Team. At that point in time, I think the only experience we had was how to register a domain name. Uh, we had absolutely no internet experience. We had one not so good developer and one not so good designer in our office who was doing like random sites for us. Um, but we didn't really have a very very good team on the technology side. So eight days later, we launched this crap site. Um, uh, Snap. This is how I think the first version of Snap Team looked. Uh, I think we had we. We probably held the world record for most amount of downtime. Uh, we had, I think, 50% downtime in the first three months. Um, and in re now, if we have 0.3% downtime over the period of one month, we have a discussion with our VP Engineering, right? So there is an evolution that, of course, happens over a period of time, and I'll talk about that. But this is really what we launched uh, when we first started. Uh, eight. This was eight days of work, I guess. Um, our initial goal was that if we can get to 100 transactions a day in three months, we'd be very happy. And this is going to be successful. We, we reached 100 transactions a day, I think, in three weeks. And it's hard for me to explain this feeling, but some entrepreneurs out there will understand that when you've been working on something for about, on a business and on the spirit of entrepreneurship for about a year and a half, almost two years, but the needle hasn't really moved a lot in retrospect. The moment you find something that has a path that you can see will scale, you give it everything you have. Because that's when you know that all that knowledge, energy, battle scars, and thick-skinned approach that you, you've developed is going to pay off because this is finally the right direction. It's what I call, you know, until that point, I think we were suffering from what I call the rickshawala effect, where if Hard work was all only thing that mattered, then the rickshawala is going to be the richest man in the world, right? But he's not, unfortunately. Um, and we had a little bit of that happening with us. So we were putting in a tremendous amount of effort. It was not, just not moving the needle. Suddenly, we were putting similar amounts of effort, and the needle was moving much faster. And we were the same people, too. So many times, the path and picking the right path and evolving into the right path is actually very critical. <coughs> So uh, we started doing this, and then suddenly we realized that consumers are saying, what is this one deal a day? I live in Gurgaon, you're giving me deals in Noida. I live in South Delhi, you're giving me deals in Faridabad. Uh, what nonsense? And so we said, okay, this daily deal thing is not going to work, clearly. So this is probably six months into launching Snapdeal, and the space had become hyper-competitive. Fortunately for us, because of our background of having dealt with a lot of, lot of merchants, we were able to move very, very fast. So we moved to the next phase, which was because people were, not, people were saying, I want more from you, we said, OK, let's see what more means. So we started offering many, many deals, Sorry. many, many deals in the city. And I think that provided us the first inflection point, serious inflection point in Snapdeal, which was, I think, September, October 2010. And suddenly when, because we had built a bunch of demand, as supply increased, people started using the site a lot more. But that was, that was a far cry from the, what the classic sort of daily deals business was, which was built on the premise that every day you'll get one curated deal, and a lot of people buy that. So we said, no, this is not what consumers want in India. So we're going to do something different as a result. We're going to, do, we're going to give them a greater assortment without really knowing how that would pan out. Fortunately, it panned out really well. Then we started growing the business further, and business started growing very, very rapidly after that. Around the same time, we see all the other market players in our vertical of e-commerce at that point in time still doing daily deals. And me and Rohit would look at each other and say, yeah, but next week. Next week, they will do what we are doing. No, no, next week, or maybe next month. We just could not understand why people were not changing. Uh, it just seemed ridiculous to us that why people were not evolving the business, because clearly that didn't work and this worked. But that's an answer you'll have to ask them for. Um, so we, we, we got to about one year ago, which was June 2011. And uh, around that time, I think we gained significant leadership in the space, about 70% transactional market share. 
and largely probably driven by the fact that we pivoted and others didn't, right? Or I won't even call it a pivot, more like an ev we evolved and others just failed to because they were stubborn about a particular model which they thought worked in other markets. In about June last year, about exactly one year ago, a lot of consumers started writing in to us saying that, hey, we trust you, we love you, we bought from you, why don't you sell us other things? And other things like physical products, I would get emails from consumers who would say, oh, I want to buy a Seagate one terabyte hard drive, why doesn't Snapdeal have it? It was like the weirdest emails ever, because we would think, but that we've never sold a physical product ever in our life, why are you asking us for a physical product to be sold on the site? And then, you know, it kind of struck us over a period of time that the mental models for Indian consumers as to what an online store means is still very fluid. They think about it very simply that, you know, I trust this brand or not. If I trust them, now I want something, do they have it or they have something, do I want it? Right? It's really as simple as that. And I think that realization didn't dawn on us until then, that point. So we started doing something very simple. We said, you know, in the spirit of being a very experimentative culture, let's try and do sort of in addition to our deals, maybe one product a day. So that was pivot number six. So consumers are asking us to sell them physical products. We can either pick to say, no, we'll only be a digital goods company, or we can say, we are going to become totally products, or we can say, let's test it out. We picked the third option. And so we started featuring like one product a day just to see what the traction was. And these started flying off the shelves. And we realized, wow, maybe because we've built so much reach on because of the services side of the business, we have a very thick demand pipe. Maybe logically speaking, the same consumer who goes out to eat or goes out for a spa treatment or goes out for a weekend holiday is really the same person buying apparel and shoes and mobile phones and watches and sunglasses. So why can't we get greater share of wallet? So we tried this out and it started working. So we said, okay, cool, uh, let's try and scale that. So we slowly, slowly increase our assortment while focusing 90% of our energy on, the, on, our, on our core deals business or local merchant commerce business. And we had no intention of doing anything differently because everything was working quite beautifully for us. Along the way, we had raised a lot of money also, so that, that helped us to keep moving very, very fast. Pivot number seven, and the last one happened uh, about October, November, so about eight, nine month, eight months ago. I, I, Rohit and I had gone to China, and essentially on a, you know, in India, when you talk to investors, uh, or I don't know now if they do or not, because Chinese e-commerce has kind of gone poo-poo, but uh, uh, middle of last year, or about up to nine months ago, most, many investors in India, Indian e-commerce space would often talk about the fact that Chinese e-commerce is there, and Indian com when will we get there, right? That's a question that was always asked of us as though I've been to China, right? So then I said, you know, let me actually go to China and figure out what happens there. So we went to China for about two weeks and we met with large majority of high quality e-commerce companies there which were operating at scale. And we realized that, man, these guys have great scale. And if this is where India is going to be three to four years from now, then maybe the VCs back in India were right. That there is great opportunity. The macro level picture is very strong in India. It will take us some time to get there. Because until then, whenever we would spend time with companies like Amazon or eBay in the US and try and learn from them, it was very hard for us to relate to their size because they are like 10, 12 years ahead of India in our, from our space perspective. But China, I thought, was like three, four years ahead. So if a large e-commerce company there was doing 250,000 transactions a day, I could see us doing that three years out, four years out. I could not see us doing 1 million transactions in any foreseeable for future, which is what really a company like an Amazon would do in the US, if not more. And we realized that for the same structural reasons that e-commerce in China as a contribution of total retail went from 0.2% to 5% in six years, was the same dynamic, we are going to see the same dynamic in India starting now, wherein we have 0.2% penetration of retail in India right now as e-commerce penetration in retail. If we go to 5% in five to six years, this space is going to become ridiculously large because retail in India is about 500 billion. But offline retail did not scale in China, that's why e-commerce took off. Offline retail did not, has not, will not, in my view, scale in India. So it'll take off in India as well. So we came back and we, that was like great introspection for us. And we said, 
Look, we have the demand. We have highest traffic. So I was looking at Comscore data yesterday, and we saw May numbers. I think for, for the last nine, 10 months, we are the highest traffic e-commerce site in, uh, according to Comscore, which is third party. So we have a lot of traffic. We have back then maybe 10 million or 11 million registered users, now about 16 million. So we had good number of captive audience that we could, that we are reaching out to every day. Um, we've seen some early success with featuring a few limited assortment of products. And most importantly, we have a team who has a lot of passion and hunger for success and like big time success, not some small success. So we said, you know, can we try doing that, what we saw in China? And I think eventually we just decided we have really no downside because on one part of the business, which is a local merchant commerce business, I think we had done a lot of stuff we had to do and there's a lot of stuff that we'll continue to do there. But on the products business, we saw tremendous headroom for growth and we saw that we had already built a lot of core foundations in the business um, while we would still need to do a lot of work after that. So we said, okay, let's start it off. And that was really the, turn, the final turning point for us and probably the final, if I may pivot, um, I try to use the word evolution, but we'll, for, this, for this talk we'll say pivot, was in about November last year, about six, six months ago, six, seven months ago where we just rapidly increased assortment. And what we saw six months later, in the last six months, I think our six months, I think our business has grown about four, five X, um, just by doing that one thing of growing the assortment. Because what started happening was, or we realized in retrospect, is that I have to end the talk. Uh, okay. Um, Maybe I'm talking more than I should. But um, what, what was happening was that we had a lot of demand, but we were deflecting a lot of that demand, that buying traffic away from the site because we just did not have the stuff people wanted. The moment we had the stuff that people wanted, a lot of those guys, there was a lot of intersection of intent to buy and availability that started happening. And so transactions went like this. And, and in retrospect, very simple. Sometimes I wonder why didn't we do it sooner, but maybe we weren't ready. Um, and and so this is where we are today, wherein I think we have probably, at last count, we probably have the largest assortment of products and of course services uh, across India. And the rate at which the business has grow grown as a result of these series of pivots, we are pretty, pretty happy about that. I think to give a context to that, we went from zero physical product shipped a day to over 12,000 product shipped a day in four and a half months. Right? It's typically taken companies who ship more than that, more than those many products, about three to four years to get to that point. Right? Maybe in totality, we've taken that long too, but our journey, I think, has been a lot more exciting. So I think just three final things, uh, just wanted to summarize. One, I think we've learned that conviction is very important. Both me and my co-founder and most of our senior team, very, very smart uh, people, but uh, also very headstrong. And over a period of time, we've learned to coexist uh, by virtue of saying, let's do the right thing for the business and let's not be stubborn about how, what we should be doing. Uh, so conviction is important, but objectivity is even more important. Um, I think one thing we've always prided ourselves on is that we should move very, very fast because you will make mistakes nonetheless, whether you move fast or slow, better to make them faster, learn and move on. Um, and then finally, I think something we at our company spend a lot of time on is our culture and having that objective outlook towards business, towards, towards the business um, is very, very critical and have people who are very open to change and flux. Because every time you move the ship a little bit, some of the scaffolding will break. And at that point, you need people who will stick by the ship. That's about it. I'm very responsive on mail and all that. So if you guys ever want to reach me, always available. I think that's all I have. So we have two minutes for questions. Yeah. So, uh, so rapid changes on the business model are easy if they are supported by equally efficient uh, changes on the technology side to get yeah. the site up change and on the operation side. So what were your learnings about uh, 
ensuring that technology is approached in a manner that you can evolve fast and operations? I think uh, technology is always a work. Technology is always a work in progress in our kind of business, right? I think we are probably less than five percent of the way where we need to be. Um, I think the, the key learning there, the key takeaway, at least for me, is uh, when you are when you are evolving really fast as a business and finding your sweet spot that helps to grow the business sustainably and fast. You have to you have to be really good at prioritization because every business head in your company, including the entrepreneurs, will always have something that they think is more important than the next thing. And then someone has to take the call in a highly objective manner that what is really the most important thing right now from a customer's perspective that we need to prioritize from let's say an engineering standpoint. Right? So I would say prioritization is most important. I, can't, I don't want to run through the list of things we'd had to do on supply chain, this, that, that. And there's a lot of work that is currently being done. Uh, but I would say prioritization is the most uh, most critical thing. I don't think so, and and also comfort with uncertainty, right? I think you need people who are comfortable with uncertainty in the lack of uh, utopian systems in the business, right? I think that is very critical. You don't want people who say, "Bhai, yeah, yeah, system nahi hai, to nahi kar sakte. right? Because then this will never work, right? You want people who will say. Okay, we are evolving on the system side. Let me figure out what's the what's the middle path right now. So, I have a question here. So, yes. Do you also planning to launch your own private brands or products? Like you've been to China and you would have seen the production facilities there, other things. Um, uh, not on the cards right now. Uh, the and I'll tell you, there's logical. I, we thought about it. Uh, there's a logical reason because I see a lot of companies doing it, and the the pitch everyone has is they are higher margin. Right, and that's really the. So, I, I think that's only one part of that. I think the other part of that is you have to probably stock up crazy amount of inventory because it's all your product, your brand. Uh, we are, our business's natural inclination is to not hold a crazy amount of inventory. So, and that's really helped our scaling because if you, you cannot grow assortment if you're going to want to own most of the things you're going to sell. Because then you just need infinite amount of capital, which is why we've seen sluggish growth in assortment in e-commerce in India till now. Until we came in, wherein we said that, hey, we don't have to own everything. Let's figure out how do we do this without owning the inventory. And that's how you grow the assortment. Um, also, there are s India is a country of manufacturing, right? Uh, not to the extent of China, but when it comes to lifestyle products, which is really where private label comes in, we have so many export houses here and so many mills and garment, uh, garment manufacturers, all of those guys have had aspirations to have domestic brands since the beginning. Now a site like ours is providing a marketplace for them to say, put on a tag, if the product is good, price is good, we'll sell it for you. Right? So there, are, there is enough mall out there that needs to get sold, enough consumers on the other side who want to buy that stuff. So why go into the process of, okay, what's the cut, what's the design, whether it will sell or not, and then being stuck with inventory, when there are other people who have means of liquidating uh, that stuff through their B2B channels. Yeah. yeah, I have a question. Yeah, so uh, I think that's a learning that we've had uh, because unfortunately the service quality standards of uh, what we would want to promise our customers may be different from what a small merchant in some city, a big or small city, will have. Right? And we've experienced that as consumers offline also. Right? There will be some restaurants you go to after which you'll say, oh, I had a great experience. You know, voucher, no voucher. And there will be some restaurants you'll go, man, that waiter was bad, the food was stinking, they treated me badly, they didn't, make me, they didn't seat me in time. So I think that's something that's been a learning process for us that how do you figure out, maybe you offer a smaller assortment of merchants to consumers, but let's offer higher quality merchants. And we've gone through that learning curve ourselves, where we, we saw that there were some merchants who were not being, um, not delivering the same service quality we intend to deliver to our customers. So we went back, audited, scratched some of them, back, blacklisted some of them, and then created an assortment which is a lot more curated. So how do you come to know about... Uh, Customer feedback. Yeah. 
Yeah, customer feedback. Okay. So, so anything that the customer, if you buy anything from us, you'll get an email which says, you know, did you like it or not? So we, we have an internal rating mechanism for everything. Oh, right. thank you. Uh, Hi, so I have a question. In the, oops, just a second. Uh, so in the e-commerce space, how much do you think are people driven just by discounts? Like, what is, what is it? Is discounts the major factor or is convenience one of the major factors? And if you have to rate, say, discount, convenience, and assortment of goods, hmm. how would you rate it in the e-commerce space in the Indian market? So I think it changes at different points in time. Um, I think which one is stacked? These I call the value, assortment, convenience are the three pillars of e-commerce, right? And the importance of each changes at different points in time, right? So I think uh, uh, you cannot compete on value because eventually that's a, that, that's just a that's a battle to the bottom, right? So if your strategy is discount-led or price-led, I should say, that's not going to work in the long run. Medium term, who knows, right? In the long run, it's not going to work. Um, I think convenience is something which consumers just expect, and you have to keep getting better at it at a, at a, at a cost which is reasonable, right? It's always, there will always be a trade-off between cost and convenience. You put in more money, you can deliver greater convenience. But then as a business, will you ever make money is a big question mark. So finding that blend is important. I think the third one is a very critical one, which I think is very, very critical at this point in time in the Indian overall retail uh, standpoint is assortment, which is, you know, in offline retail, if you look at top 20 cities, you go to a Levi's store in, um, in Delhi, for instance, right? Like I live near in West Delhi, in Rajauri Garden Levi store is the size of two times this stage. That's about it. They have such limited assortment. You go to the US, you go to the Levi shop and shop inside Macy's, it'll be three times the size of a Levi store here. So even in the large cities, the problem is that there is limited assortment even in the EBOs, exclusive brand outlets, right? In the small cities, there is no Levi's. So we are actually solving the problem of making available a large assortment to consumers, right? And many of those consumers, at least where availability is a problem, are not that value conscious also. They're not that price conscious when it comes to non-standardized products like lifestyle, right? So I think you have to figure out what's the right blend for your business. Our bet was, which I think has paid off, that if we ramp up assortment, because when we started doing products, we saw some guys selling books and electronics, some guys selling electronics, some guys selling shoes. We didn't see a place where people could go and say, okay, I can buy a wooden giraffe for my mantelpiece as a mantelpiece, and I can buy sunglasses, and I can buy a watch, and I can buy a mobile, and I can buy a voucher for a restaurant near me. We didn't see that, right? So we saw that as the opportunity, but I think it will keep changing. Oh, yeah. Hi, Kunal. Uh, I just need to, uh, hi, this is Ashutosh. I just need to thank you for your website to allow me to uh, enjoy the uh, great buffet lunch at Hotel Juhu Marriott, Mumbai. Thank you. And that was a very good uh, point in my courtship period and that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a video testimonial from you after this. You uh, wait for me. I have a question. How yes. hard or easy is it for you to establish merchant relationships with A grade merchants slash retailers in the non-product space? So it, as far as spas and restaurants go, uh, I guess you partially answered my question. How often do you see a JW Marriott or let's say an Olive or an Indigo offering you a discount as opposed to some random Chinese restaurant in the middle of nowhere which people may not really want to patronize? So, um, <coughs> I'll answer that but I think the last part of what you said I don't agree with. I, th I don't think people only want to eat at JW Marriott's because then when you go outside this, this restaurant should be full which it won't be. Right? So, uh, I think uh, I always incriminate ourselves also as just trying to build a business for ourselves. But 99% of the market out there is not us, right? They want value products and services at great value, uh, but, at a good, but at a good service quality level also. So the, the, the goal here is not to find the most expensive premium place which will offer a discount, I think the goal is to provide the right thing at the right value to the right customer, right? So that may mean providing a buffet at JW Marriott, but that may also mean providing a great valuable deal at a Moti Mare Deluxe behind my house in Punjab, right? It's different strokes for different folks. Um, coming to the product side, I think it's kind of similar. 
right? Not everyone wants to buy a Samsung S3 while we may have aspirations to do so. But that means that you need to have a much wider assortment that caters to a broader audience. Yes, sir. How are you? Things that you have gone through and what were the challenges and learnings? Yeah, um, so uh, we raised our first round which was an angel round from a US investor. Uh, interestingly, he had, ne so, I, so here's an interesting, I actually got married in this hall two months ago, so <laughs> I have fond memories. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I could put my wife on speaker, she'll be happy. Uh, but uh, he, so why I mentioned that was first time he came to India, was for the wedding two months ago. And he gave us money without having been to the US, without having been to India and having met me three times. Right, with no PowerPoint, no business plan, nothing. It was just pure punt. Um, fortunately, it's worked out really well for him. Uh, that was our first round of financing. I think the reason he gave us money was, it's just the people. He thought that we could do something. Not, not knowing what, but we could do something. Uh, so that was the first round of capital, small amount of money. The second was uh, when we raised our Series A, this is when the card business that you saw had started doing reasonably well. And that's when one of the investors, Indo-US Ventures, um, in retrospect, even I would not finance that business, right, if I had the money, uh, but fortunately someone did. And, uh, and so we, that round took us about six months to close because I had no idea what this VC financing means. Because the earlier angel round, we just wrapped up in like one week. We signed something, I don't know what we signed, and we got the money. Uh, but VCs are, spe are especially careful, which is good. Uh, then our Series B happened, so the first Series A was about two million. Our Series B happened, which was about around eight, eight and a half million at that time's exchange rate, um, happened in December 2010 which was when we had demonstrated strong velocity of growth in the business, uh, when we were only a deals company. Um, the, the third, uh, the final round of funding, which was about a year ago, was uh, happened with, uh, with a large US-based VC, wherein we met them, and 30 days later we had money in the bank. And, and I think the reason for that was that, you know, the thing that investors most look, look towards is not only traction, but also how logical you are about what you are doing. Are you doing things just because everyone else is doing them, or are you doing things because that's the right objective thing to do? And because our philosophy as a business has always been that, whenever people met us, they got comfortable with the fact that, you know, we don't know where the space is going, we don't necessarily know where this company will grow, yeah, everyone knows this company, this company is really popular, this, that, but we don't really know. And that probably holds true till this date. However, I think people always got comfortable with the fact that these guys will figure it out. Uh, especially when you have a long history of pivots, I think people are comfortable that these guys will find their, find their way in this journey. Uh, so those are, in total, totality, we raised about uh, 50 million. Um, and uh, and I, think, I think most of our investors are pretty happy, which is actually another very important thing. Whenever you meet an investor, always tell them that it is very important for you, to you that they should make money. That's sort of a golden rule of thumb that has always worked for me. Uh, with, of course, honest intent, not, not, not just saying it. But it is very, very important. Because if you feel it, you should say it, because they want to hear that. Last uh, question. Kunal? Yeah, I see. Right here. Yeah. Uh, you made a very interesting point uh, regarding the assortment. And uh, uh, you know, at your scale, do you have, can you validate that with any kind of data that uh, the long tail really uh, does work? So for example, to, you know, 80% of revenue for you would come from what percentage of uh, products? Sure. Or what percentage of customers? That's an excellent question, something we think about a lot also. Um, but I think it's too early to take a call on that because you just don't know what the cause and effect is, right? People may be coming into the site because of value priced long tail assortment but may end up buying more certain brands which are which are branded products which have higher certainty of experience for them right uh, of product quality etc etc performance but um, you know 
it'll be an interesting experiment to say that let's remove all the long tail and see what sells. And my gut tells me your sales, even though the 20% the, the that account for 80% of sales, if you remove the other 80% assortment, I think that 20, the sales generated out of those 20% will fall drastically. Because uh, we are trying to provide a virtual shopping experience. And shopping experience offline or online is not only about finding exactly what you wanted. It's also a discovery experience. And sometimes uh, people gain confidence <laughs> in a virtual store by seeing a larger assortment. But I don't have necessarily clear data. I think it's too early to say what positive or negative impact does a longer assortment have. What I would definitely say is that there is tremendous value in data-oriented merchandising on a site. Right? Uh, and trying to personalize the experience as much as possible. So we have a team which has folks from you know, Yahoo R&D, Google R&D, who are actually only working on one thing. How do we provide a more personalized experience to the customer? Because, yeah, we're going to always have an increasing assortment, but let's show the most relevant things to that customer. It's very, very critical. Okay, we have thinning audience, so maybe we should call it quits. Yeah? Okay, thank you.